In lesson four, we look at the eye and binocular vision, the structures and functions within the eye, as well as the process of accommodation. It's a good idea to draw a section of the human eye, write down all of the labels and the functions. This will help you for examination purposes. All right, so binocular vision, if you look at the word, the prefix bi refers to the number two and ocular re refers to eyes. So binocular vision is when we have vision of an object using both eyes at the same time. So if you look at this fish, the right eye covers vision from here right till here. So this entire area is covered with the right eye and the left eye has a similar region on the left hand side, but this yellow portion in the front, that's the portion where both eyes are looking at the same time. That's what we call binocular vision. Many organisms have their eyes on the side of their heads. For example, pigeons. Right, we'll find that that will allow a greater area to be viewed, but the area for binocular vision is very small. Whereas organisms like humans, who have our eyes in the front, both of our eyes are in the front of the head, we've got a smaller range of vision sideways, but you'll find that the area of overlap of the two eyes is larger, that is the area of binocular vision. So if you look at this diagram now, the red area, that triangle, would represent the area that is visible with the right eye. This yellow triangle would then represent the area that is visible to the left eye. And then this orange portion would be the area of overlap, which is the area of binocular vision. Now, since the one eye gives you a slightly different view of the object, as compared to the other eye. When we use binocular vision, these two views are put together and this allows for what we call stereoscopic vision, which means vision in 3D. This video will explain that process in more detail. Take a look at this photo. Got it? Now here's another one. It's an image of the same trolley, but from a slightly different angle. Both look pretty two-dimensional, right? Do you think there's anything we could do to make them look 3D? How about this? We're not just shaking one image. We're actually quickly alternating between the two similar images. Doesn't it look like you could jump on the trolley and ride it all the way down the hill? Take a look at some more examples. Here are the two photos. And here's what they look like when we alternate them. Pretty cool, right? What you're looking at is a stereo animated illusion. All we're doing is jumping back and forth between two similar but different pictures. Your brain interprets the difference between the two flat images as depth, simulating what your eyes do with real three-dimensional objects. You could see from that video, when you swap quickly between two similar images, you'll get a 3D view of an object. Now with our eyes, we're not swapping between two similar objects. We're getting two slightly different views at the same time from the two eyes. And this allows for stereoscopic vision or vision in 3D. We call it depth perception, that you can get an idea of how deep something is or how far it is compared to something else. Okay, so if you look at a cross section of the eye, there are a number of different labels. The outermost part, which is shown in this light blue color, in reality would be a white color in the eye, and that is known as the sclera. Underneath that, we have a layer known as the choroid. Now be careful, this is choroid. When we did reproduction, we learned about the chorion. Right? So don't mix those two words up. Sometimes learners with the spelling, they mix these two up, and it, it refers to something completely different. And then the innermost layer, which will be the receptor, is known as the retina. So the retina is the receptor. If you remember the word sclera, it's S, C, and then the R is somewhere towards the end. So sclera, then comes the choroid, and then the retina is the innermost layer. 
on the retina, there's a specific area, which is the area for the clearest vision in color. And this, there's a scientific name for via centralis, but we accept the name yellow spot as well. The retina being the receptor will send impulses on the optic nerve, which is optic, optometrist, etc., has to do with the eye. So the nerve coming from the eye is the optic nerve. And where the optic nerve leaves, there's no retina at that point. So we refer to that as being the blind spot. When we move now to the front of the eye, this diagram would represent what we used to as being the front view of the eye. If we have a comparison, the sclera would be this white portion that we see of the eye, right? And then in the front of the eye, there's a portion that doesn't have the white, right? So there's a transparent portion that's more curved in the front, which is known as the cornea. And then there's this iris, which here is at the bottom as well as the top. That is the colored part of the eye. And then there's a gap between the iris, which is known as the pupil. So this dot or this black circle in the eye is not actually a structure. It's a hole. And when you're looking there, you're looking through the hole into the back of the eye, which is the retina. On the outer portion of the cornea and the sclera, there's a transparent membrane for protection, which is known as the conjunctiva. In the front chamber here, between the cornea and the iris, this area is filled with a liquid known as the aqueous humor. And then the back portion of the eye is filled with a gel known as the vitreous humor. We've got then the ciliary muscle, which is here and here. And that is attached to suspensory ligaments and these suspensory ligaments suspend and hold the lens in position. That's the lens. Okay, so if we look at the functions now of the various parts that we've, we've already identified. The sclera, its structure is that it's a tough layer and it being on the outside, normally when we look at anatomy of different parts of the body, we find that whatever's on the outside of the organ is usually for protection. So it's a tough layer that is for protection. And it also can assist in maintaining the shape of the eye. The choroid, the second layer, has many blood vessels within it. And this provides nutrition to the eye, nutrients and oxygen. It is darkly pigmented. So the color of the choroid is dark. And this prevents reflection of light within the eye. It prevents light bouncing around within the eye. The retina, we said, is the receptor. It contains photoreceptors. Photo, if you remember from photosynthesis, photo is light synthesis making. So photo is light. They are light receptors within the retina. They are known as rods and cones, the two types. And these receptors, like all other receptors, receive the stimulus and convert it to an impulse. Within the retina, there's the yellow spot, which is an area that only has cones in a high concentration. And this is the area which allows for the clearest color vision to occur. The blind spot is the area where the optic nerve leaves the eyeball and it has no rods and cones. Therefore, if an image falls here, there'll be no impulse made and hence it is known as the blind spot. The optic nerve, it carries the impulses from the retina to the cerebrum and we know that the cerebrum receives and interprets information from the sense organs, the cerebrum will receive the information and understand it. The conjunctiva is a transparent membrane which protects the eye surface and the lining of the eyelid. So it continues from the cornea and it goes within the inside of your eyelid, the conjunctiva. The cornea allows light through and allows for refraction of light. Refraction means bending of light. This is important to make sure that the image lands on the correct area, which is the retina. The iris is a colored muscle 
that controls the amount of light that passes into the eye by adjusting the size of the pupil. The pupil is a hole in the center of the iris that allows light to enter into the eye. Aqueous humor, we said aqua refers to water. It's a fluid that keeps the shape of the cornea and it also plays a role in refraction. The ciliary muscle and suspensory ligaments, these two adjust the tension on the lens. So by the ciliary muscle contracting and relaxing, it will change how tight the suspensory, suspensory ligaments are, and that will adjust the shape of the lens. And that process is called accommodation for near vision. The vitreous humor is a clear gel which maintains the shape of the eye and also plays a role in refraction, just as the aqueous humor does. We know that when you look through water, the image will not be the same as when looking through air. And the reason is to do with the density of a liquid or with the gel. And the, that property of the aqueous humor and vitreous humor also allows that to make uh, or play a role rather in the process of refraction. So the lens is a clear flexible structure that can change its shape con convexity. Convexity means how round it is. And this will be in order to change the amount of refraction that occurs or bending of light so that a clear focus can occur whether you are looking at a near object or a distant object and that is the process of accommodation. When we look at the process of image formation, light is reflected from objects. So when we see something, the, if there's no light, in an area, it's completely dark, you won't see anything. But when there is light in an area, the light will bounce off different objects and that light will come towards the eye, enter through the cornea, then the aqueous humor, through the pupil, through the lens, through the vitreous humor. Obviously, all of these structures are transparent and allow light to move through them. And it will fall on the retina where the image then will be formed and converted that stimulus into and impulse. All of the structures named above, excluding the pupil, will bring about some refraction or bending of light so that the image is focused on the retina. So whatever object you're looking at, the light that comes to the eye, the cornea is more convex, more rounded compared to the rest of the eye. This will cause bending of the light. The light will go through the cornea, through the aqueous humor, through the lens where more bending occurs, through the vitreous humor until a clear image will hopefully fall onto the retina. So this is showing you that process. The light bounces off this object. It goes through the cornea and bends. It goes through the pupil. It, before that, the aqueous humor. Then the lens will bend it further. And it goes through the vitreous humor until this image of the object will then land on the retina. And interestingly, it refracts so much that the object actually will be having an image which is upside down on the retina, but the brain will interpret this as being the correct way. So if they ask you about seeing, it's actually quite easy. If you know your diagram of the eye, you're just gonna say that the light comes from the object and then you just start naming the different parts. You say it will go through the cornea, which will cause refraction. It goes through the aqueous humor, then through the pupil, then through the lens, There'll be much more refraction there depending on whether it's near or far. And it goes through the vitreous humor and then it goes to the retina. So you can see just by naming the parts in order, you'll be able to describe the process of vision. And then it's not over there because vision does not happen at the eye. It happens at the cerebrum. So we said that the main structures for refraction would be the curved cornea and lens, but the aqueous humor and vitreous humor also play a role in that process. When the image lands on the retina, there are special photoreceptors known as rods and cones. And these pick up the images according to their specific adaptations. So the rod is called a rod because it is rod shaped and the cone is cone shaped. We don't need to know the detail of their structures for examination purposes. But the function of the rods is that the rods work in dull light, in dumb light, and they assist for gray 
scale vision. So sometimes if you wake up at night and the lights are off, but you can still see that the bed is here and there's a table here, that is vision due to the rods. The cones provide color vision in bright light. So in this way, these two photoreceptors will take the light stimulus, convert it into a nerve impulse on the retina, and then transfer that nerve impulse from the retina via the optic nerve. And the optic nerve will take this to the cerebrum. The cerebrum will then interpret and understand what you've seen. So seeing actually happens in the brain, in the cerebrum, and not at the eye. And sometimes I get learners who will say that, no, no, at your eye, you're seeing at your eye, not at the brain. And I, we can prove that to you, that actually seeing happens at the brain and not at the eye. So this video will assist us with that process. When you're looking at this video, I need you to concentrate in the middle of the video, look in the middle of the screen and read those words very carefully without uh, looking away from the screen. A reminder, look at the words in the center of the screen and read them and follow the instructions that are there. Right, so if that works properly, you'll find that the back of your hand looks like it's moving around. In reality, we know our hand and the skin is not moving around. But that shows you that because of the background moving all of the time and you're focusing on the center, your brain is saying, okay, the background is moving. It gets used to say, okay, background is moving. I'm focusing on reading what's here in the center. And now when you look away from that onto your hand, the brain is still telling itself, okay, the background is moving. So when you look at your hand, you find it looks like your hand is moving around. Right, so that shows you that vision actually happens at the cerebrum. Okay, now we look at the process known as accommodation. And accommodation refers to when you're looking at the near object, how the eye changes. Right, there's three specific parts of the eye that are res responsible for accommodation, namely the ciliary muscle, the suspensory ligament, and the lens. Right, those are the main ones responsible for the process. It refers to the ability of the eye to change the shape or convexity, which means the roundness of the lens, to ensure a clear image is formed on the retina, whether the image is near or distant. So when a person looks at a far object, right, a distant object, something that's more than six meters away, we'll find that the lens is longer. Right? So one way to remember is that for a long distance, the lens will be longer and thinner, and that the proper word there would be it's less convex, it's less rounded. And because it's less rounded, there'll be less refraction and a clear image falls on the retina. And if you're looking at something that's nearby, less than six meters away, in order to accommodate that process onto your retina, the lens now becomes shorter and rounder. We say the proper word is it becomes more convex. And because it's more convex, there'll be more refraction more bending of the light, and that greater amount of refraction will still ensure that the image falls on the retina. Right, so all of the steps, if we're talking of near vision, which is something that is less than six meters away, first thing that will happen is that the ciliary muscles contract and come closer to each other. When they contract, the sclera is pulled forward and the suspensory ligaments slacken. Right, so this, you can see the sclera being pulled forward. I didn't put that in yellow. It comes in certain memos and sometimes it's excluded from the memos. So you can learn it if you really want to, but the other points I think are quite vital, those that are in yellow, because they generally are always in the memos when you look at the final papers. Right, so the su suspensory ligaments become slackened, which means that they become folded like this here. And because they are loose, there isn't tension on the lens. The tension on the lens decreases. And because of decreased tension on the lens, the lens becomes more convex, more rounded. When it's more rounded, we know that there will be more of the process of refraction. 
So we can say that the refractive power of the lens increases or the amount of refraction increases and a clear image will form on the retina and that will allow you to see the object clearly. So if you look at this diagram at the bottom, this is a lens for far distance. It's suited like this. If it's near vision, you'll find that these ciliary muscles came closer by contracting, suspensory ligaments became slackened, the lens became more rounded, more convex, there's more refraction, a clear image falls on the retina. Now obviously, near and far are opposites of each other. So if you've learned near vision properly, there's no need to learn far vision off by heart. By understanding that far is the opposite of near, we can just change these statements and you'll get your answer for far vision. That for far vision, if in near vision, the ciliary muscles contract, for far vision, it will relax. If the sclera was pulled forward, here it will go back to its original position. The suspensory ligaments here, they were slackened. There they won't be loose, they'll be tighter. We call it being taut, T-A-U-T. And that because now they are tighter and taut, it's gonna cause more tension instead of less tension on the lens. There'll be more tension on the lens and the lens will become less convex and the refractive power will decrease. The last sentence does not change because whether you're looking near or far, you want the clear image to be formed on the retina. So when we're talking of far vision, to repeat, the ciliary muscles will relax, the sclera goes back to its normal position, suspensory ligaments become taut and tight. This causes increase in tension on the lens and the lens becomes less convex or round, hence there'll be less refraction occurring and a clear image will fall on the retina. So this eye here, if you look at the bottom right hand side is for near vision. If we want far vision, these, uh, these ciliary muscles relax and go further apart. Suspensory ligaments are taut and tight. They pull the lens to be longer in shape like this here and less convex. There's less refraction and a clear image falls on the retina. All right, this is again just repetition so that we can hopefully it can sink in nicely into our cerebrums. That if you're looking at something that's far away, like clouds in the sky, then we find that the ciliary muscles are relaxed and far from each other. And this causes tension on the su suspensory ligaments. We say suspensory ligaments are taut and that causes the lens to become longer and flatter, which we say is less convex. There's less refraction, a clear image falls on the retina. If you're looking at the wristwatch, which is near vision, we're gonna find that the ciliary muscles contract, they come closer to each other, the ligaments become slackened, and there's less tension on the lens, so it comes back to a more convex shape and there'll be more refraction, more bending, and the clear image still falls on the retina. So again here, for long vision, the shape of the lens is longer and shorter and narrower this way, whereas for close vision, we find it's more rounded, more convex, and you can say almost fatter this way across. And actually, if you look at the lens, it's maybe deceptive because we're seeing it in 2D, the diagrams, but the lens in reality is actually in 3D. So when you're talking of it becoming more convex, it's rounder like a ball, basically. Okay, so a way to remember the difference between near vision and far vision, right? We know when we look at something more closely, right? We look more closely. It's, close vision, near vision. Then you'll find that the letters are very similar. For close with a C, the ciliary muscles with a C will again with a C contract, okay? And the next two letters are also the same, that the suspensory ligaments will then slacken, not be loose. And we said when you look more closely, LMC, then again LMC, the lens becomes more convex, as a result, there'll be more refraction and a clear image falling on the retina. And if we talk of distant vision, when you're looking at a long distance, then we're gonna find here that the letters already are not uh, the same. For far vision or distant vision, you're gonna have a F and then a C, so it's not linking, so you know, the next letter is not gonna be the same. We're gonna have ciliary muscles then relaxing. The suspensory ligaments won't slacken, they're gonna be taut. And when you LL for looking long distance, 
you're going to have LL where the lens becomes less convex. And as a result, there's less refraction. And when there's less refraction, the clear image still lands on the retina. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this video. In the next video, we're going to look at the pupil mechanism or the pupil reflex, as well as some of the disorders when it comes to vision.